we don't understand what the real impact to the business could be and should be, and we don't have a plan. And that is why cybersecurity is the number one priority for organizations today. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, welcome, welcome to one of my favorite times of the week, and I hope it's one of your favorite times of the week, and that's our episode of Life of a CISO where we get to spend 30 minutes together talking about what it means to be a world-class CISO. And by the way, we're coming up on a year of cyber crisis. So if you haven't picked up your copy, if you haven't given it to friends or family members, what are you waiting for? Because guess what? If you haven't figured it out yet, we are in the midst of a cyber crisis. And what I mean by that is it's very simple. There is a huge disconnect between what is really happening, what are the exposures, and what people understand and believe. That's why we put it in a crisis. It's not because there's not a solution. There are solutions. We give individuals solutions all the time. I work with, when we started doing our cyber bodyguard service, we're working with a lot of high profile individuals that are getting targeted online and we're giving them actionable solutions that they can take. The problem is they weren't doing the right thing. They weren't taking the right action. We're working with a lot of companies that in the past has paid millions of dollars to Ransomware attacks have been hit and compromised on a regular basis, have had lawsuits and fines and regulatory compliance brought against them. And we work with them and we're able to implement a solution. So the good news is there are solutions out there. The problem is people don't really understand what they are. They're not asking for help and they're implementing the wrong things. So that's really what we're going to focus in on today is dealing with the current cyber crisis. And coincidentally, what's the foundational reason of why a cyber crisis exists in a business? Because that's really what cyber crisis, my book is about protecting your business from real world threats in the virtual world. What is the root cause reason? It's simple. There's no translator in most businesses that are able to translate between technical cybersecurity, technical risk and exposures, and business language. And then take that business language and translate it back into an executable cybersecurity plan that the team can understand and act on. If we want to get real and we want to be honest with ourselves, it's because the CISO position is not in most organizations, right? Some of you can get mad at me. I always say most, not all. In most organizations, the CISO position is being filled by a non-CISO. And that's really the fundamental problem that we're dealing with. The best analogy I can give is I'm doing work in Germany. I don't speak German and my clients over there don't speak English. So I need a translator. What if I hire somebody who only speaks English? Yeah, they could they could fake German. They speak more German than me. So as far as I know, they're better than I am. But if they really are super fluent in English and really are not that comfortable in German, two things are going to happen. One, where do you think they're going to spend most of their time? Speaking to me. 
because English is their comfort zone. That's where they feel comfortable. They feel very uncomfortable speaking German because they're not very good at it. So they're going to end up spending a lot more time with me. Then when I have questions or information or details that I want to get across to my clients, the translator is not going to do a very good job. They're not going to do an effective job and they're not going to make the client happy. So what do you think is going to happen very, very quickly? The client is going to get frustrated. The client is going to get angry. The client is probably going to stop doing business with me because of that translator and that relationship is going to go south and I'm going to have very little, if any, interaction with that customer and they're going to be very, very frustrated. And to be honest, if I lose a big customer and I'm not able to communicate with my customer, I'm very frustrated. So you now have a situation where the two entities that are supposed to be communicating and talking are frustrated annoyed and angry with each other and decide to just no longer engage. And that is probably the best way to describe what's happening in most organizations. You have an executive suite. You have a board of directors that is very, very concerned about cybersecurity. It is their top priority. I have seen it, it slipped with COVID Cybersecurity in most organizations in 2020 and 2021 because of COVID has slipped in terms of a priority. But I am meeting now with more and more customers. I'm doing more keynotes. I'm re-engaging, which is awesome. I love to get back out there, right? Don't get me wrong. I love working with you virtually, right? It's not the same as looking somebody in the eye, give them a handshake, give them a hug. Yeah, I'm a hugger. Hugs are great way to exchange energy and really talk to somebody in person, face to face. And what I'm hearing over and over and over again in the last couple of weeks is cybersecurity has moved up to be the number one business objective. It is the number one priority for the organization. And just so we're clear, these are manufacturing companies, Fortune 50 companies, where all of their money is made in manufacturing. And if you haven't been following manufacturing, there's a lot of supply chain issues. There's a lot of shortages. There's a lot of backlog and all those other factors. Even in light, of all those shortages and backlogs for the manufacturing companies, cybersecurity is number one. I would have thought supply chain shortages would have been number one, it's number two, right? I would have thought employee work conditions would have been number one, it's number three. So it's very, very interesting. What we're seeing is companies are starting to wake up and recognize how important cybersecurity is. The issue though is they're not getting the information in the language they want because many, 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 not, not all, most, not all, most, not all organizations either don't have a CISO and they're relying on a security engineer that doesn't speak business or they have a CISO that's not really a CISO that doesn't really know or speak business and is trying to communicate to them in a language they don't understand. And that's why this model is broken. And just so we're clear, that's why cybersecurity is number one at most companies. It's not because of the ongoing conflict or war uh, with Russia and Ukraine. It's not because all the increased attacks. It's not because any of those things. I talk with CEOs, I talk with executives. One of the thing that has picked up and I love doing it because A, it helps me fulfill my purpose of making cyberspace a safe place to live, work and raise a family, but it also lets me interact and learn from them is I'm doing a lot more board of director cybersecurity briefings 
where board of directors are bringing me in to talk to them about cybersecurity. And remember my rule, when you're briefing a board, what is the first rule? We'll see who's listened to my previous podcast. You can virtually raise your hand and say you got it. What's the first rule? Start with a question. Understand the audience. I remember communication. How many ears do you have? How many mouths do you have? Right? Maybe you use this more than you use this, right? So you always start by listening or asking questions. And I always start off with uh, one or two questions, depending on the board or the mood that I'm in. First question that I'll usually ask is, why am I here? You clearly, these are, these are big companies. Why am I here? You have security folks and you have a security team. Why did you ask me come to brief you? What is the big challenge that you're having? That's usually how I start. If sometimes they give that to me, sometimes in the intro they tell Eric, where you're here because of X, then I'll ask the next question. Mr. or Mrs. Chairman, what is the information that if I provide over the next 45 minutes will make this presentation the most valuable meeting you've attended the entire year? Powerful. I didn't, and, and you should see their reaction to like, they're like, no one's ever asked me that. And I'm like, and the answer is, and they, they give you an answer. So I, I always start by asking questions. And then what I always hear back is, Eric, the reason why you're here is, and the reason why cybersecurity is our number one priority is because we don't understand or know what's happening. It's not because I never ever hear a board tell me, Eric, the reason why we made cybersecurity number one is because we're concerned that we might hit, get hit by a ransomware attack. Now that's a fundamental component of that answer, right? It's a subcomponent, but the answer I the qu answer I always get from them is, Eric, we don't understand or know this area. We're not getting accurate data for us to be able to make decisions. And whenever you have an area in business that you don't understand or know, it becomes a top priority. In the manufacturing case, you know why cybersecurity was number one and supply, same, supply chain shortage was number two? It's because they understand and know and have a plan for supply chain shortage. Yeah, it's an issue. They said, Eric, we know that we can't get some of our manufacturing. Right? With one of the, the large automobile makers that I'm working with, they said, Eric, we know that there's a chip supply. Right? And we have all these cars that were built and we can't sell it because they don't have the chips to actually work and run. But we also recognize and know that it's going to take time. We have a solution that we're implementing, but it's going to take time. So we understand that. We recognize it as a problem. It is on our list, we're tracking it, but we have the data, we understand the reasons, we know what's behind it, we know that there's some things we can't control, and we're putting in a short and long-term plan that's already in motion for us to be able to address this, to minimize the current shortfalls, and to address this so it doesn't happen again in the future. Cybersecurity, they don't have that. Eric, we don't understand or know what our issues are. We really don't know how bad or good it is. We get these technical briefings from our technical folks with technical information and technical data that means nothing to us. We don't understand what the real impact to the business could be and should be, and we don't have a plan. And that is why cybersecurity is the number one priority for organizations today. It's because they don't get information in the language they know communicated to them 
and having a clear plan in place to execute against it. Let me put it another way. The world desperately needs world-class CISOs right now, today. I sort of joke you have the Batman light, right, where they go in and they shine the light of Batman in the sky at Gotham City when they're in trouble, right, that they need Batman to come save them. Companies are putting up the light that says CISO, right? They are desperately in need of a superhero called the Chief Information Security Officer to come in and help them and secure the organization. The only question I have to you, are you going to answer the call? Are you going to step up and say, I'm in and play full out? Because to me, there's really three general groups of people that are listening to this podcast. The first group is, Eric, I don't have the experience. I, I, I really don't have the experience. I'm really not ready. I'm just sort of listening into what's going on and what's happening. Let me help you out here. If you go in and learn and read a few business books, if you take my CISO course, I'm not trying to sell you anything here. This is all about giving you free resources to help you become world-class. But if you want to accelerate it in six months, there is our amazing CISO cert. If you just email me, ecole at secure-anchor.com, I'll pass it on to my team and they'll follow up with you. Or you can go to secure-anchor.com slash CISO. We also have launched some smaller offerings because the CISO cert, some said we're little too high price tag for them. So we do have some other offerings to get you started. So there's ways to accelerate you pretty quickly. And I'll tell you right now, I've seen it over and over and over again. If you fully commit for six months, not only are you CISO material, not only will you be able to get a job as a CISO, but you know a heck of a lot more than the security engineers that are playing the role of a CISO. You're so much farther ahead there. So that, that's the first group. The second group of folks are the sweet spot. Those are people that have been five, seven years, understand security. They've had different roles, so they do understand business. You might still not give yourself enough credit. You might say, I'm not system material. You really are. And the point is, you're a heck of a lot better than many of the people that are claiming to be CISOs. Now, just so we're clear, there are some really good CISOs, but that's a small percent, right? There's also a lot of people that don't know what a CISO is. They think it's a glorified technical position. They think it's a succession path for a security engineer. And they think the only way that they can become a CISO is by being a world-class security engineer for 15 years and then telling the organization, if you don't give me the CISO title, I'm going to leave. And they don't want to le lose their best engineer. They give them the title. And that is the problem. Because they're not a CISO. They're a world-class security engineer. It's two different jobs. So that's the second person. And really, that's the main focus. That, that's who I'm really talking to and trying to get excited and pumped up. The third Ja, the third category are people that are currently CISOs. Now, here's the cool part. The people that are currently CISOs that are listening to my life of a CISO, because I've engaged with them, I've talked to them, I've worked with a lot of them, keep doing what you're doing because you are a true CISO. You should be encouraging and helping more, you should be training. I urge you to move up, right, to bigger companies. So the, the jobs at the small and medium-sized business can be filled by new up-and-comers. So you're needed at the Fortune 10. If you're currently a CISO now and you're listening to this, you get it. Because I'll tell you right now, if you're not a real CISO, you wouldn't listen to my podcast because, trust me, I have a lot of people who have a CISO title 
that hate me, that think I'm the devil, right? And, and they criticize me and just look at some of the comments and posts and stuff like, they're like, Eric doesn't get it. A CISO is a uh, security engineer. It's tech. It's not a business position or all that other stuff. And, and it's like, yeah, okay, you're not, you're not successful. You're not willing to admit it, right? So usually those people don't listen to my podcast because they don't want to hear what I have to say. But the point is, engage. The world needs you right now. These companies are desperately looking for world-class CISOs. So you might say, okay, Eric, depending on which category, how do I get there? So let's just start laying it out. First thing is what's the best way to learn a language? If we really, if you go in and study cases where they're teaching adults, the, uh, I'll, I'll answer your question. The best way to learn a language is to teach it to somebody when they're three or four years old. That, that, that really is the best, proven over and over again. You have these children that at three and four years old, they pick up four or five languages very, very quickly because they're in that learning mode and learning stage. Most of us aren't three or four years old. By the way, if you're listening to my podcast and you're under five, heck, if you listen to my podcast and you're under 10, please drop me an email, ecole at secure-anchor.com. I wanna send you a present. I, I really wanna send you, it's, it's a cool gift. I really wanna send you something very nice because that's, that's impressive. And to be honest with you, I also want to send a present to your parents, right? Because that's pretty awesome and cool that you're listening there. But, but I don't think my target audience is people under 10. So that, that's probably out. What is the second way to learn a language? The best way to learn a language? Well, it really goes back to my example of kids. Why is it most of the time that a five-year-old can pick up a second language so quickly because that's what the parents are speaking at home. They go to school and they learn English, but then at home they're immersed in another language. And when you're immersed in another language, that is the quickest, fastest, easiest way to learn it. If you look at the government, State Department that needs to train people and teach people languages. You know how language school works? They send you off to an area that often either simulates the country or sometimes they'll actually send you to the country. We have to learn a language. And your schooling is you are immersed in that language and that's all you speak. Nobody speaks English. If you want to get something, get food, go to the bathroom, you either learn the language or you starve, right? Immersion is the best possible way to learn that language. So my first thing to you is, how much time are you spending with business folks? How much time are you spending at business conferences? How much time are you spending at business events? I talk to these technical folks and they go, Eric, I'm a world-class security engineer or I'm a security engineer for two or three years and I really want to become a CISO. I want to learn business, but I just not able to do it. And I say, great. Who do you go to lunch with? Oh, well, it's mainly security engineers. And who are your friends? Oh, they're all security engineers. And what conferences do you go to? Oh, it's all security, cybersecurity technical conferences. You're emerging yourself in the cybersecurity technology, and you're wondering why you're not able to pick up another language. You need to switch that. You need to start for the next six months, only go to business conferences. You need to go in and only talk to business people and only go to lunch with business folks. Trust me, they're out there. Right? It's out of your comfort zone. It's not something you're used to doing, but that's the first advice. The next advice on immersion is get a CISO job. 
You might say, but Eric, I'm not qualified. Trust me. If you know that a CISO is not a technical position, if you know that a CISO is a translator, if you know that a CISO needs to speak and understand business and you need to ask questions more than you uh, talk and you can't talk technical to business folks, if you know those things, you know more than most of the CISOs out there. You know more than most out there because you, you will not make those same basic mistakes. And here's the really, really good news. There is such a need and demand for being a world-class CISO that if you go in and listen to these podcasts, and I also have a, a course on uh, becoming a CISO and how to do the interviewing, but if you show up and behave and act like a business person in the interview, you will be able to get a CISO job. And that is the best immersion on the planet. That is the best immersion out there because if you are a CISO with the title, it solves all those issues. You have access to the business folks. You're invited to business meetings. You're expected to go to business conferences. You're expected to be a business leader. So the best part is overcome the fear, recognize that you are world-class and start applying for CISO positions. Start becoming a CISO. Oh, but Eric, no one will hire me. How many resumes have you submitted? How many jobs have you applied to? Well, I haven't applied to any. Really? Where's the data behind that? Right? I, I, I joke with people. I, I love when they make these statements, right? That th These broad statements. No one will hire me as a CISO, yet you haven't applied to one single job. Are you kidding me? Come on. So apply. Now I'll help you out here. Don't come back to me after you applied to three, five, 10, or 20. After you've applied to a thousand, then let's talk. Th th then let's talk and figure out what's going on there. Now, I'm going to cover this in my next episode on how you actually use the data to become a CISO. But the point is, you should be applying to every CISO position out there. You should be learning and getting feedback on how good or bad your resume is. And you should be going on as many interviews as possible. If you are truly deep down inside have a calling to be a world-class CISO, why aren't you spending two hours a day on this? Why aren't you doing 10 interviews a week? And the cool part is we're still in this whatever stage of the pandemic we're in, but most organizations are still doing virtual interviews. And most interviews with executives are 20 minutes, maybe 30 max. So why can't you do one or two a day? Why can't you go out there? Why can't you start making this a priority? So that's the best immersion factor. The next immersion factor is, what are you reading? Do you realize books are one of the best teaching tools on the planet. You can learn from some of the best, brightest minds that are out there. Why aren't you reading a book a week? Oh, Eric, I don't have to, wait, wait, wait. You're telling me you wanna become a world-class CISO. You're watching TV for one to two hours a night. And you're telling me that you don't have time to read? Come on, right, same, same thing there. Why can't you read for an hour a night? An hour, that's it, an hour is not that much. I, I can guarantee, no matter how busy you think your life is, we can find 60 minutes of wasted time every single day. Why can't you read? Do you realize most books are gonna be three to five hours? 
So if you're reading seven hours, an hour a day, you can get at least one, maybe two books done. That means in a month, you've read five to seven business books. That puts you in the upper percentile. Many people, this, this blew me away because I read all the time. This totally blew me away that most people read less than five books a month. Uh, sorry, a year. I wish it was a month. A year. Crazy. So right now, if you are serious, I'm going to give you an easy one. If you are truly serious, zeros and ones. It's an amazing book. It's written by one of the uh, Silicon Valley uh, venture capitalist per people that have invested in a ton of companies. And you can read in about three or four hours. It's an easy read. It's big print. It's 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 great book. I'll start you off real easy. And here's what I actually want you to do. Since you'll be able to get it done in about three hours. This week, show me if you're committed. Show me if you're ready to play full out. I'm asking for 60 minutes. Read it twice. Read it three hours and then spend the next three hours or three and a half hours reading it again. This is a test. This is a test of your commitment. You're telling me you want to be a world-class CISO. So I'm giving you a test for seven hours to see how committed you are. Let's check in with you next week and see how you did. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Life of a CISO and look forward to seeing you next week where we talk about being world-class CISOs. <laughs>